Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. Greater St. Louis Inc. is about creating more jobs for all of our residents. A much bigger story than just one hospital in one town. But St. Louis is an incredibly rich environment for architecture. Today on Spotlight, why bees might be confused when certain flowers bloom. Plus, a new book examines the healthcare system. In honor of Father's Day, meet a father-daughter duo creating beautiful artwork together. But first, treasures at the library inside their latest exhibit. It's Sunday and you're watching the Emmy Award winning Spotlight. We are standing in the Great Hall of Central Library, which is one of the great works of architecture in the United States. And uh, we are celebrating a collection we have here at the St. Louis Public Library, the Stedman Collection, which is a collection of seminal works of architecture. Some of the rarest, most beautiful, most remarkable printed works of architecture in what's called allied arts in the United States. It was a gift to the library in the 1920s by a great St. Louisan. Uh, we've maintained it, uh, we've actually added to it since, and we wanted to make sure that the public understood and could see and enjoy one of the great treasures that they own. When Mr. Stedman was collecting many of these great works of art, uh, enormously rare in some cases, the very first printed work of architecture in the, the world is in this collection. The internet wasn't even a dream, it wasn't something that could have been thought of, although he was a remarkable man, an inventor, an industrialist, an engineer. But uh, books were the best technology to share information. It's very different now. Many of these works are available on our website, can be seen, but they're works of art in themselves, uh, they're important in themselves, so it's valuable and remarkable to see the object right in front of you. When people visit the Stedman exhibit here in Central Library, they are, are standing in this incredible space, classic architecture. But St. Louis is an incredibly rich environment for architecture, and two of the greatest works are represented in this room. The Wainwright Tomb, which is in Bell Fountain Cemetery here in St. Louis. A lot of St. Louisans have never seen it, don't know it's here but it's considered by many the greatest work of architecture in the United States. We actually built the tomb. Here in this space, you can get an idea of exactly how big it is. We're hoping that we'll convince many people to go out and see it. It's an astonishing, beautiful thing, and Bell Fountain actually provides tours of it. We wanted to intrigue people and show them some of the treasures St. Louis holds. We have Sullivan's original drawings, so you can uh, walk into the space and see the drawings transfer into the building itself. It's an amazing experience. Uh, and then we move into more modern times. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was one of Sullivan's students, and Frank Lloyd Wright did some amazing things here in St. Louis, two wonderful houses, but the Krauss House is here in St. Louis, uh, a dedicated, remarkable couple who built it, treasured it for 50 years. So we have a lovely piece of it that people can visit and they can read about how it was built. So you can see the progression, the remarkable built environment of St. Louis, and you can look around you and see the great printed treasures that inspired much of this work. The Stedman exhibit will be available to be seen here at Central Library until January of 2022 and you can find visitation information on our website at slpl.org. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. I have noticed this year markedly earlier flowering in a lot of species, which I think is likely due to the warmer winter we had. Matthew Austin is on a mission at Shaw Nature Reserve. He's a postdoctoral fellow with the Living Earth Collaborative at Washington University in St. Louis. The project that I'm working on is looking at the ecological and evolutionary implications on pollination systems as a result of a change in climate. So we know that climate change has altered the time of year that plants flower. 
In certain places, including the greater St. Louis area, we see that a warming climate is not only causing flowers to bloom earlier, but in many species, it's also causing flowering to end later. Andy says that may confuse bees. Suddenly, there are a lot more flowering options at one time. Flowers might have shifted earlier, while the time of year that bees are active has stayed the same. And if bees are confused and things don't happen the way they are supposed to, in time, the beauty and survival of flowers suffer. More than that, the survival of bees is a concern. The time of year that bees are out, they could be left without the flowers that they normally feed from. While research is ongoing on bee populations, if bees are not able to feed from flowers that they have historically in the past, if they're not able to shift to feeding on a different species, you could see declines of their populations. And there's more than honey to think about. Many of our fruits and vegetables, tomatoes, blueberries, strawberries, a lot of these just delicious foods that people love to eat and can also just affect um, how likely we are to see the flowers that we enjoy in our native environment. So my research is exploring what affects these altered flowering times and greater number of species flowering at the same time have caused for pollination and floral evolution. To determine potential outcomes, Austin will examine the survival of flowers native to Missouri. He reviewed historical records of flowering times collected along this path, dating back to the 1930s to early 40s. Most of the species here at Shaw are flowering at a different time now than they used to about 80 years ago. Then conducting his own pollination study, he chose the flower, Jacob's Ladder. To conduct my hand pollination experiments, I'm doing the work that a bee would do. However, to be very um, careful and controlled in my experimentation, I have to make sure that other bees or other pollinators aren't also pollinating the flowers that I'm working with. With climate change and many different flowers in bloom at the same time, cross-pollination by confused, busy bees is more likely. The question that my hand pollination experiments are testing is whether if a flower receives pollen from a different species, it will be a reproductive dead end. Will that flower not reproduce at all compared to if that same type of flower received pollen from a different flower of its own species? Austin is manipulating various conditions for Jacob's ladder to see what happens. A third treatment is self-pollination, receiving pollen from the same flower, where a flower simply pollinates itself before any pollen could be transferred from a different species. And while self-pollination is not quite as good as a flower receiving pollen from a different flower of its own species, it's still better than the reproductive dead end that occurs when a flower receives pollen from a different species. After a long pandemic winter, the early cheerful blooms are welcomed by many. Yet, from this perspective, the future of flowers and bees doesn't feel nearly as cheerful. We're similarly concerned about declines of other pollinators, such as butterflies, flies, moths. It's hard to predict because ecosystems are incredibly complex and interconnected communities and you never know what the cascading effects of one change will have on other organisms. HEC has been bringing you positive programming and award-winning content for decades. Arts, education, culture, in-depth discussions, films, and more. All in one place, hecmedia.org. In the small town of Bryan, Ohio, a community hospital barely survives. At the same time, the people it serves struggle to stay healthy as good paying jobs disappear. Brian Alexander's new book, The Hospital, Life, Death and Dollars in a Small American Town, takes a deep look at what's broken in the healthcare system. The contributing writer for The Atlantic makes a complex story understandable while showing us the very real effects of inequality on the people of the town. Americans die earlier, Americans live less healthy lives, and yet we pay far more for health care in this country than anybody else does. We are doing it wrong. It's such a well-researched book. It's amazing. It's just a great work of journalism. And just hearing you talk about it, I can see how deep your understanding is of this. Thank you. I mean, that's, 
it was three years uh, in the making and it, it, I basically did nothing else for three years. I moved to the town. I thought to myself uh, once I was there that there was a real, a, a much bigger story here than just about one hospital in one town. And there was a bigger story even than about the American healthcare system. Uh, it was a story about how our economic system, especially over the last 30, 40 years, has affected the health of Americans and the lives of Americans. Uh, and I could tell that story through the lens of this one hospital. Your book has a cast of characters. It's not just a, you know, sort of dive into the research about the hospital, but there's a whole cast of characters that humanize this story so much. I wondered if we could talk about them a little, like I was just thinking about the, the person Keith, the man named Keith, who worked at Menards. Right. Uh, Keith worked in, in uh, auto-related manufacturing, uh, lost his job in the Great Recession, uh, managed to get another job, a, a relatively decent job, got married, uh, had a baby. Uh, his wife, unfortunately, uh, had a very serious uh, medical problem. I don't want to give too much away, but Keith ended up working at Menards for fourteen fifty an hour. And the policy there uh, is that you've got to be there 90 days before you can sign on to health insurance. And once you do sign on to health insurance, deductibles can be as much as $5,000. Uh, and it's expensive. The, the employee's contribution is, is quite expensive. Uh, and this has a cascade of effects on Keith and Keith's family. It, and it's not so much that uh, Keith, who was diagnosed with diabetes, um, is unique. Keith is not unique. Uh, in this country, many, many people with diabetes are rationing their insulin. They're not taking their insulin at, because they can't afford it. Uh, and there is a series of consequences that results when you do not um, address your, your diabetes properly. Um, people are literally stuck between the choices of going broke or dying in this country. Uh, and Keith is faced with those choices. Has the Affordable Care Act helped any of this that you've yes. seen? Uh, it, there's a good chance that the hospital in Bryan, Ohio would have closed without the Affordable Care Act because many more people could afford health insurance with their subsidies, especially in a community like Bryan and, and surrounding Williams County, where people are barely uh, keeping their heads above water. This is a really human book, you know? And so if you, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding between small towns and larger cities and so on. And this really humanizes the people in this town of Bryan, Ohio, and makes me think about people around me, so. But that's, that's exactly what I was trying to do. So I appreciate the, your comment. That's, it's gratifying. Scan the QR code on your screen with your phone's camera to watch the full interview and find out what Brian thinks would help the health care system and who profited the most during COVID. Or just head to hecmedia.org. A dance performance from the Muddy Dance Company later on Spotlight. This rooftop garden has been nourishing body and soul for years, but it was completely obscured to passersby until now. Urban Harvest SDL has long dreamed of beautifying the streetscape here at the Food Roof Farm. The Food Roof Farm was built in 2015 and has continued to attract people for years. However, we realized from the street, we weren't largely visible. So they reached out to father and daughter team Robert and Liza Fishbone to create an eye-catching mural. Each mural that we do is site specific. We look at what happens in the area, uh, what kind of people live here, is there a rich history we can tap into? What's the mission or the goal or the vision of the client? So Urban Harvest STL exists to grow food and grow community. And I think that aspect of community growth um, is really tapped into with the mural. This father and daughter team came together at the urging of Liza, a multidisciplinary artist in her own right, living in Austin, Texas. While Robert, a prolific visual artist, has been involved in over 200 mural projects, much of them with his late wife, Sarah. This opportunity arose uh, that my daughter caught wind of, and it was a, a contest here in St. Louis to design a mural for the uh, west-facing wall of KDHX radio. I told Liza, I just don't think we could pull this off. 
And then three days before the application was due, she called me back. She goes, come on, Dan, we, we, we got to enter. It's a lot of money. And, and besides, I want to learn how to paint big murals from you. <laughs> well, how could a father say no, right? <laughs> He has all of this old school knowledge. He's been doing this for over 40 years. And I come at it from like a, a younger place and a different kind of style. So it's a really cool collaboration. Working with my daughter was a whole new relationship for us. And it really deepened our connection. If we weren't father and daughter, we'd be really best friends. <laughs> It took a lot of planning to transform this once bland building into this vibrant work of art. We hosted him here at the food roof and sat amongst the plants and talked about the work Urban Harvest is doing in the community. From that conversation, we pulled the concept of nourishment. Food is nourishment, community is nourishment, and also art is nourishment. The design process in any art is really pretty mysterious. It's like, how are you going to interpret this thing? that you know, is maybe somewhat undefinable. And that's really where the art comes in, is how do we take our impressions, how do we take the goals, the building, the area, and filter it through the sum total of our experience and come up with something that's fresh and new and nourishing. Not only did he look at our building from the exterior, looking at it from the street, but he also wanted to see the eyes of our own building out to the city and what it saw. And some of those elements are visible in the work that he ultimately ended up producing. First was, let's create a mural that people will stop and go, whoa, what is this place? We wanted to embody some of their mission and about the plants that they grow on the roof. So the mural design is kind of psychedelic, but it's, it's a little more peaceful <laughs> than the other walls that we've done. And it has four of the flowers that we found on the roof. And then it also includes some design motifs that are inspired by the architecture surrounding the building. The flowers that we picked, are they're not vegetables, which are what are grown on the roof. They're actually flowers that attract pollinators, which is, of course, one of the most important issues facing anyone growing food today is how do you attract pollinators for your garden? One of the challenges that all mural painters have to deal with is how do we take our design and make it really big on the wall? There are several different techniques that are used. The easiest one is we take our design, then we do a black line tracing of everything in it so it looks like a coloring book. And we photograph that and we throw it up with a video projector. Another challenge is impermanence. Much of Robert and Sarah's work has been lost to time, deterioration, and rehab. Everything is impermanent. It took us a while to really uh, uh, adopt that as mural painters. Um, the first few years, you know, we had a lot of work up. It was stayed in great shape. When our Lindy Squared mural got torn down, it really hit us hard. We, we didn't quite understand how important it was, not just to the city, but, but to us. And we just realized, okay, they're here, they're gone. It's our job. <laughs> and so we had to make this transition. But for today and into the distant future, it's become a community asset. It's at a street corner that's heavily trafficked here in St. Louis and invites people to just sort of celebrate the colorfulness and the vibrancy of the city. It's all about elevating people's spirits. With every stroke of the bow, every stroke of the brush, with every stroke of genius, the arts make life in St. Louis richer, not just emotionally, but also economically. In our region, the arts create almost $600 million a year in economic activity, supporting more than 19,000 jobs, generating almost $60 million for state and local governments, with almost 12 million annual arts-related visits. That's more than all St. Louis sporting events combined. Whether in a park, on a street, or a wall, experimental or a classic, the arts deserve our support because the arts help support us. HEC Media is proud to be our region's home for arts, education, and culture. Because in St. Louis, the arts mean business. Change is in the air for the St. Louis business community. A new organization called Greater St. Louis Inc. merges together five civic organizations. The new group is laser focused on economic growth and bringing new jobs to the St. Louis region. Greater St. Louis Inc. has a bold agenda designed to make the region globally competitive 
while shoring up local business districts. Jason Hall is the CEO of Greater St. Louis, Inc. This Granite City native represents a new generation of civic leaders. He's been called intense and has an unbridled enthusiasm for the future of St. Louis. Greater St. Louis, Inc. is about creating more economic opportunities, more jobs for all of our residents here in St. Louis. We need to grow. We need to make sure that that growth and those opportunities are within reach of all of our residents. And so Greater St. Louis Inc. represents the business community coming together to help guide that so we can reach our full potential uh, here in St. Louis. Not so much what we're doing for the community, but what we're doing with the community as a business sector. We have a critical role to play. And business leaders, they know how to create jobs, they know how to think long term, spot emerging trends, but there are a set of challenges when you're trying to take a, a place, a metropolitan region, and move in a common direction to create those jobs and make sure they happen here, not in other places. Uh, you have to work together. That is a problem and an opportunity that's bigger than any one single business. Greater St. Louis Inc. brings all of that collective ambition, all that we want to achieve together so that we can work together to go to where we need to be for St. Louis, for the next generation and for the next set of opportunities. The response from the business community thus far has been terrific. People said, now I see it's exciting. It's a new vision for where the economy can go. And so we've had people reaching out to us faster than we can get to them to say, we wanna put not only our, our financial resources, what's really struck me is people say, I wanna put my time behind this. And that's even more special when you can get all of that. People taking ownership, long-term stewardship, not just being an employer in the community, but being a volunteer in the community, being a part of the community, that is powerful. And I think that's an incredible force. Who are our biggest competitors, the cities we're fighting against? Right here in the Midwest, where I went to law school, in Nashville, Tennessee, they are organized, they are focused, they are getting things done and they are growing. Indianapolis, another city in the Midwest, um, growing. I mean, they have really got their act together in a vision for where they wanna go as a community. Denver, I mean, it's been a real tremendous success story. People forget, you know, in the energy bust of the 80s, what Denver was like, oh, but absolutely. because they were resilient, they fought back, it's one of the you know, fastest growing uh, communities in this country and uh, a great place for technology jobs and families. It's because they're resilient and we are as well. So you're saying don't be intimidated by competition, no. learn from it. Learn from it and, and realize we've got often cases more assets, but what we're not doing is an effective job of is, is leaning into those collectively and really unleashing their full potential and value. 1904 wasn't a finish line, it was a starting line. That's right, that's absolutely right. And we can be even better than that. Scan the QR code on your screen with your phone's camera to watch the full interview and find out why he reached out to 15 elected officials or just head to hecmedia.org. HEC Films, explore, inspire, educate, and entertain. HEC Films, just one of the many facets of award-winning content you'll find at hecmedia.org. We're here at the uh, St. Louis Science Center's new special exhibition, Mummies of the World. People can expect to see an exhibition that's going to tell the tale about mummification across the globe. You're going to be able to see uh, several different real mummified remains on display. Most of the time when you have an exhibition, you're talking about objects. Uh, we don't want to refer to these as objects. These are people, and that's really important to us because they mattered during their lifetime, and they still matter in their death. We're going to treat them with as much respect as possible throughout your stay in the exhibition while still illuminating things about their lives. And that's kind of how we pay homage to them is by making sure that we don't forget during your experience that these were people. We try to treat them with respect and let them tell their own story about their lives, their culture that they came from, and uh, a little bit about the uh, scientific process of mummification as well. 
I think it's important to study mummies because we can not only learn a little bit more about the process of preservation that they went through, but we can learn a little bit more about ourselves. A lot of these cultures are historically important to modern civilization. We can learn a little bit about their diet, we can learn a little bit about their religion and how it affects us today, but also kind of peel back the layers of time and understand where we came from. And I think that helps frame where we are. So in this exhibition, we're gonna be talking a lot about uh, real people. We're also going to be talking a little bit about death. And that can be a little disconcerting for some small children. We just recommend that you have a conversation with your family before deciding to come in because we wanna make sure the whole family has a good experience inside the exhibition. We're doing a lot to ensure that everybody has access to this exhibition, but we can keep everybody safe at the same time. Uh, one of the ways that we're doing that is we've reduced our capacity in the exhibition. You can find out more information on our website at slsc.org. I recommend planning ahead. This exhibit takes about 30 to 45 minutes to walk through in its entirety, but it is definitely worth that time. HEC Media, bringing you culture and community. Find all of HEC's positive programming and award-winning content at hecmedia.org. Next week, the compelling story of a swim school teaching young kids. Plus, meet some of the players of the Gateway Archers Beep Baseball. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.